here at the Human Craniofacial and Skeletal Identification Lab. We have a special focus on anything that's to do with skeletal identification. That includes everything through to craniofacial identification, so comparison of skulls and faces. Video superimposition is another one. This is a method where you already have some idea about who the person may be, and you have a facial photograph of those individuals. And then we can compare the skull to those anti-mortem face images to see which person it matches to. We have a special interest in radiographic comparisons. So when remains are found that can't be identified through the usual mechanisms of DNA, if there are radiographs that exist of an individual that were taken during their lifetime, we can take then radiographs of the skeletal remains and compare the two to see if we can identify the person. Our goals are to improve the methods in terms of accuracy, reliability, precision, decreasing error rates, and trying to facilitate the methods so that they can result in identifications as quickly as possible. We provide a consultancy service to the DPAA to repatriate fallen soldiers from the Korean War. The U.S. military had been collecting chest radiographs of everyone who joined the military back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s to scan for tuberculosis. Back in 2005, we found these chest radiographs and we were able to access quite a number of them that were linked to missing persons, especially for the Korean War. Now we had the basis for establishing a new tool for identifying people. We had to bring in an expert to develop that into a proper standard operating procedure. That expert was Professor Carl Steffen. The chest radiograph comparison method is similar to fingerprints in that it's looking at the biological structure based on the reference images. There's always a pressure to try to find ways to take on these challenging cases and process these cases as quickly as possible while maintaining the accuracy and meeting a very high standard. And so that's where University of Queensland helping us develop better methods, helping us review difficult cases very quickly comes into play. To be able to perform any type of casework, you have to pass the competency program. The Huck Lab help us to train and then competency test people who are going to be prospective analysts. The Huck's Lab has an anatomy laboratory. Our people get to actually see the real anatomy. And so our analysts know exactly what they're looking at every time they look at a radiographic image. This work is important for the very simple reason that enables individuals to be repatriated to their family members. And that brings closure for those families. Facial approximation is a process of estimating a face under blind conditions, so not knowing what the person looked like ahead of time, just from the skull alone. Facial soft tissue depth markers are placed upon the skull at specific landmark locations and then these are then used to guide the construction of the soft tissues to ultimately generate a face. So a wide variety of different organisations utilise the mean facial soft tissue thickness data that we've generated through the T-tables and they've been instrumental to helping to improve the accuracy of the facial approximations that can be generated. The data within these tables were drawn from published data from individual data sets and they've then been compiled together and published in the open access in the International Journal of Legal Medicine. The accuracy of data with the tissue depth markers is extremely important because the more information you have and the more accurate it is, the closer the resemblance is more likely going to be when you finish the phase and release it to the media. The most recent iteration published last year in 2023 corresponds to over 222,000 individual data points from over 19,000 individuals. Well, that provides a much more reliable data set that practitioners in the field can use to make sure that their cases are using the most up-to-date and reliable, comprehensive and accurate data. In craniofacial superimposition, we're comparing an image of a skull to an image of a face. We need to make sure the focus distance matches, because even if the anatomy does match, 
but the focus distance of two images doesn't, we can't accurately compare the images and make an identification. Everybody's eyes are a certain size because they have to function physiologically. And so your eye fissure length is very similar between individuals and it's similar enough that we can use an average value for your value. And so then if we had a photograph of you, we can measure that distance, use it as a scale to tell the focus distance that the camera was set at. Perspective X is the algorithm that enables the focus distance to be estimated from a face photograph. And so it requires you to know the focal length of the lens that was used on the camera at the time the photograph was taken. And once you have that, you can then measure the length of the eye fissure, put it into the formula and calculate the focus distance. What we found was that multiple DSLR cameras across different brands did work with Perspective X. And we found that our range of prime lenses did work and we found that the profile extension that we created does work, so it allows us to estimate both frontal and profile images, which was previously not possible. At the Hux ID Lab, we like to focus on the forensic anthropology methods that haven't quite been fully developed. And some of these sit at the fringes of forensic science. Our aim is to give those methods a more fundamental basis in science and that way they become more reliable, more accurate, they can be used with more confidence. We've got a good track record and we think that we can pair up well with other universities to leverage not only our skills but also theirs to improve the science of these identification methods even further. Collaborations between a big applied laboratory that keenly knows what the problems are with universities that have the ability to do things to help address those problems. That's the future of forensic science in my view.